You are listening to the Dark Fantastic Podcast. Welcome to this new episode of the Dark Fantastic Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to talk about the return of Dean Koontz. I'm going to talk about The Shadow, one of my favorite Pulp Fiction characters ever. I'm going to have a guest on, on the show who is going to share uh, with me some uh, great stories and some great uh, information about Pulp Fiction and The Shadow. And also there are going to be uh, a few more surprises, including a new uh, story. So uh, stay tuned and uh, let's begin. I want to talk a little bit about Dean Koontz. He doesn't get really uh, much critical acclaim. Of course, he doesn't really need defending. Uh, he, 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 uh, he sells millions of copies. He's one of the best-selling authors of all time. I think he sold close to half a billion uh, copies of his books in several languages. But... For some reason, I don't think he is as popular as other writers in his rank, mainly in the critical circles. I think that's because he's not really into publicity and he's not really, maybe he is not as media savvy as other writers in that you know stratosphere like uh, Stephen King and J.K. Rowling and uh, the people who sell like hundreds and hundreds of millions of copies it isn't easy talking about Dean Koontz's work and why I like his work because his output is uneven. Some of his books are terrific, some of his books are good, some of his books can even be called classics. But he's also written a lot of books that are just not up to the usual level that you expect from someone who's capable of writing near classics. The first book I read by him was TikTok. Uh, I think it was published in the early 90s. It's not really one of his best books, but it introduced me to his addictive style and and his voice, which is very unique. Especially uh, TikTok, especially is uh, is a very humorous book. It's it's very plainly uh, written. Because if you read Dean Koontz, you know that he writes in several styles and he seems to veer between a verbose kind of writing and uh, and a minimalist, fast-paced kind of writing. Uh, TikTok was just a fun book, not that long, has a very silly plot. But, as I said before, it introduced me to his addictive style and and that book was enough for me to to entice me into discovering this new writer and to explore further. Later, I read Midnight, uh, which which is one of his best books, uh, a true cross-genre novel that combines like science fiction, Uh, an homage to uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau, also a book that is very heavy on on atmosphere and and terrifying in places, and it's also, which I came to find out later on, it has like the typical or the basic cornerstones of a Dean Koontz novel, which is plenty of atmosphere, uh, lots of characters, an interest in technology, fear of technology, super wealthy, super influential villains. Usually they are uh, 
billionaires working in uh, somewhere like Silicon Valley and they own big tech companies. So that was basically my introduction to the basic style of Dean Koontz. Later on, I read a number of his classics like Hideaway, The Fun House, which, is a, which I later discovered was a novelization of the, of the movie by uh, Toby Hooper. And also I read the terrific The Voice of the Night, which came out in 1980. And uh, I believe uh, it must have influenced Stephen King because it does the coming of age thing that Stephen King is known for in stories like The Body, which was later adapted into the movie Stand By Me. And of course, Stephen King's It... The, the the huge book, I think his most famous and his most popular book. So that that's one of the most famous things Stephen King is, 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 is known for, which is the coming of age story. But a lot of people don't know that Dean Koontz wrote The Voice of the Night in 1980, which is years before Stephen King got into the coming of age story which he's most famous for and I think the voice of the night was a trailblazer I know it's almost blasphemous to say that but I think with the voice of the night Dean Koontz does the coming of age story in which young people preteen uh, children or, or, uh, or young teenagers get into a mystery, begin to lose innocence by discovering some evil act that happens in close by to them or in their small town. In my humble opinion, I think he does it even better than uh, some of Stephen King's stories. I think The Voice of the Night is actually a much better book than It. Because I always believed that it is an overrated book. It's uh, it's overwritten. It's overlong. It's not one of Stephen King's best books. But The Voice of the Night is a better book because it is more restrained. It is more minimalist in its approach. And it's also a realistic story. It doesn't have any kind of fantastic elements. And I think it deserves to be known more. It's one of his, uh, I think, one of his, of Dean Koontz's best books. And I'm mentioning The Voice of the Night and, and, uh, and Midnight and titles like Hideaway and, and The Fun House because... In the past 10 or 15 years, there, is a, there, there was a shift in Kunz's writing and he became, I think, less original and he began recycling his plots a lot and his writing style sometimes became too, I think, too self-indulgent and I think that began in, in, in the late 90s with Koontz, with uh, a number of his books feeling the same and feeling a bit repetitive. Uh, Cold Fire comes to mind, Dragon Tears, which are all entertaining books, but they didn't have the freshness that his writing had in the early 80s and, and uh, up to the early 90s, I think, which is his best period and with very few exceptions like the masterpiece that is from the corner of his eyes and uh, the first book in the Odd Thomas uh, series the 2000s weren't really a good time for uh, Dean Koontz readers and from then on I think Koontz's tendency to preach his politics came into overdrive with some of his books coming off as something similar to 
Christian fiction, I think, because reading about Kuntz and reading interviews with Kuntz, uh, I know that he is a man of faith and that uh, religion is, is very important to him. I think especially in the last 30 years or so. And uh, I don't mind that. I think sometimes it adds a very uh, moving, uh, humane element to his stories and adds to his imagination. And uh, people of uh, writers of faith, a lot of them write terrific books like C.S. Lewis. But sometimes his tendency to preach not just about faith but also about politics and his disillusionment with uh, with modern times i think anyone who has read more than a couple of dean Kuhn's books in the past 20 years knows what i'm talking about and that turned me off as a reader especially in the last 10 years, because a lot of his books, uh, and he is a prolific author, uh, a lot of his books in that time, honestly, weren't very entertaining. But I'm glad to say that Kuhn's is back. He's back on form. Um, his books, his new books, are very, very uh, well written, are fun to read, are full of energy. And he feels like the Dean Koons that uh, that we know and love. His uh, his style is uh, again com combines um, his new style. I mean, with his new books, combines humor, stylish prose, inventive plots, appealing characters. He's, he writes like a younger writer. He writes with an energy that has been missing from his books for at least 15 years. One of his most recent books is uh, Devoted, which is another story about a boy and a special dog and a, a big tech villain. And on the surface, it, it looks like just another one of his, you know, another, another copy of his usual elements. But actually Devoted is, uh, feels very fresh. It's unputdownable. And I would even uh, recommend that book to someone who has never read Dean Koons before as an introduction to the best of, of Dean Koons. And it's, it's a good book for younger readers as well. It's not very scary, it's not very violent, and it has something, um, I think, really important to say. And uh, the book he wrote... After that, I think it came in. Uh, it came out in 2020, I think, or early 2021. Uh, a book called Elsewhere, which is more of a sci-fi fantasy kind of book about parallel universes. It's not as good as Devoted, but it's still obvious when you read that book that Koons is having a blast and the book has a lot of energy and it has a very sweet uh, relationship between the characters, uh, a father and a, and a daughter. And again, it has nods to uh, the writings of H.G. Wells and it's written in short chapters and it uh, it's also suitable for younger readers. And reading those two books, Devoted and Elsewhere, you feel that Dean Koons is energized again, his writing feels fresh again. In short, if you had given up on Koons, uh, like me, because of his output in the last 10 or 15 years, which, is, uh, which included good books, but a lot of, of, of the books he wrote in that time were not up to par. But I'm glad to say that Koons is back. And uh, you should check out his new books. They are worth it. And I think you, you're going to have a good time reading them. I came across The Shadow way back in 1994. 
the the shadow movie that came out in 94 was visually stunning uh, i saw it in theaters um, i was amazed by how stylish the the movie looked and and as a kid at the time i uh, the visuals the, the the mystery of the character really appealed to me but i had no idea who the shadow was he he was basically a strange type of of superhero that i'd never heard of before uh, because i uh, i was a casual comic book reader at the time i knew about batman i knew about superman uh, i knew about you know the the biggies the the, the flash the green lantern I even knew about Ghost Rider and some of the Marvel stuff, although I, I always preferred DC Comics to uh, to Marvel. And the Shadow had the elements that I liked, and he was, to me at the time, he seemed a bit similar to uh, to Batman. There was some similarities there, because there was the character of Lamont Cranston, this playboy millionaire um, uh, who's who basically puts on a costume uh, a cape and uh, and and goes out uh, at night and fights crime but the shadow was was different because he felt maybe he was maybe l less uh, less of a of a dark character than batman and the uh, 1930s atmosphere of the movie was very different than uh, the Batman movies that were out at the time and after the film came out on video and uh, after I saw it several times I got more and more into the character his costume his voice his psychic abilities uh, his enemies um, like the the enemy in the movie, the villain in the movie, uh, Shiwan Khan. The whole universe of the shadow character just captivated me. And I think being introduced to to the character in, in uh, with such a visually stylish movie, uh, basically uh, high impact stuff for a, for a kid. I think it left a mark on me and I think that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, one of the reasons that has made me into a, a lifelong fan of the character. Looking back now, having been a fan of the Shadow for I don't know decades, I think that quite frankly there is no character like the Shadow. And I think Part of the reason that when I got more and more into the character and I read more and more about the character, uh, one of the reasons that the Shadow is such an appealing, indelible character is his influence. Because basically, uh, with this character, uh, Walter B. Gibson, who created the Shadow, I think he created the blueprint for a lot of what came after, um, especially in terms of superheroes and pulp fiction heroes. Because if you read the the the, the books, especially the the shadow books that were that were first, uh, the, these stories were first published as novel length stories in the shadow magazine in the 1930s and 40s basically walter gibson created every single aspect of the modern american superhero mythology that you know now basically the alter ego like the bruce wayne character walter, walter gibson came came up with that with the lamont cranston character uh, everything else about superheroes, you know, with the utility belts, the gadgets, uh, 
the especially with Batman and the DC characters who who have the noirish kind of darker aspects. Walter Gibson came up with all that first. If you read books like uh, Lingo, and if you read books like uh, The Black Master, and uh, and the, the, even the the earlier books, the earlier stories by Gibson, like The Living Shadow and The Eyes of the, of the Shadow, and um, the Death uh, Tower and all these books. Basically, Gibson created the blueprint for everything that came after. And aside from that, the, those books are beyond entertaining. And as far as Pulp Fiction goes, uh, they are gold standards, in my opinion. Some of them can be called classics of the genre. Uh, like the incomparable the, the Grove of Doom I think it's one of the best Pulp Fiction books ever written and I don't want to ruin the, the plot for you but if you are starting out with uh, you know just discovering the, the shadow save the Grove of Doom for later because the Grove of Doom although it has its flaws and it, it's, it's dated in some aspects like all Pulp Fiction uh, is by now because it's uh, the best of Pulp Fiction is basically almost a hundred years old by now so there are some f flaws to to Pulp Fiction but uh, The Shadow, The Grove of Doom is just a terrific Pulp Fiction book and, uh, the, bo and the book I just mentioned uh, Lingo that book if anyone doubts what Walter B. Gibson could achieve with uh, with the, with the limitations within the limitations of the genre, and what he could achieve with the character of the shadow, and and uh, how wide a range of stories he could tell with that character. You should also read Lingo, because Lingo is basically a magic trick of a book. Uh, because as as I got more and more into the shadow books and uh, read more about Walter B. Gibson, I discovered that he was uh, basically uh, into uh, he was basically an, an amateur illusionist, and he was really into magic tricks and he performed magic, and he wrote a lot of books about uh, about magic tricks, uh, and Lingo is the epitome of Walter's B, Walter B. Gibson's, uh, you know, mastery of, of, of magic, magic tricks and how he integrated the elements of the magic trick and the, uh, the elements of, uh, of, the, of the craft of the illusionist into story. And again, I can't talk about the, the plot of Lingo, but... Uh, trust me when I say it has one of the most entertaining, most surprising twists ever written in a, in a Pulp Fiction uh, mystery story. And as I ma mentioned earlier, the influence of the shadow in, on American popular entertainment can't be stressed enough. Uh, he came before Doc Savage, he came before Superman, and of course... He uh, preceded Batman, and if you are a frequent visitor to my website, The Dark Fantastic, you can find numerous reviews of the Shadow Books, uh, which might help you to choose, go to my website and uh, read uh, a, a number of, uh, of uh, read from the number of Shadow reviews I have, and I think that will help you to choose uh, a book. Uh, I basically, as you can tell, I love the character. Uh, it's one of my all-time favorite uh, literary superheroes. And uh, I highly uh, recommend uh, readers of fantasy, mystery stories, even uh, noir literature to check out the character. Because... Uh, if you 
enter the shadow universe, you are really in for something special. My guest today is one of the most prolific authors I've ever come across. Will Murray has written dozens of books in numerous genres under many names, including several Doc Savage novels, books in the Marvel Universe, books in the Tarzan Universe, Sherlock Holmes stories, and many, many more. He's one of the last true champions of Pulp Fiction, and his new book, The Rise of the Shadow, available now, is a love letter to one of my favorite fictional characters of all time. Uh, Will was gracious enough to uh, to come on the show and uh, you know give me some of his time. Uh, thank you, Will. And uh, if you are a fan of Pulp Fiction, if you are a fan of superheroes, if you are a kid at heart, if you like comic books, if you like fantasy, and of course, like me, if you are a fan of The Shadow, then listen to this interview. The Rise of the Shadow, which I think is an expansion of, uh, of an earlier book you wrote, the, uh, the, sh- the, the History of the Shadow, right? Uh, not exactly. Uh, okay. I did plan to reprint that book and ex- in an expanded form, but the book became so long, so big, that I decided I would take that project and cut it in half, and this is the back half of what was going to be the expanded Duende History of the Shadow magazine. was still going to do an expanded Duende History of the Shadow magazine, but that's a different book that I right now I'm calling Dark Avenger, The Strange Saga of the Shadow. And uh, because I, I took a look at the Rise of the Shadow, uh, and, uh, and as a huge Shadow fan, I think it's, it's one of the um, definitive books on the Shadow. So your book was like a lifesaver, I think, for, uh, for fans. So... Well, thank you for saying that. I'm surprised at how positively people are receiving this book. For this reason, it ended up being a compendium of old articles of mine, some of which I expanded significantly. The radio chapter is greatly expanded from its original uh, uh, print version. And so if you look at this book objectively, There's a very long article on the shadow on radio, and then it's basically interviews and a few articles on various aspects of of the character and his creators. So it's a bit of a hodgepodge, yet people, Mm. you know, really love it. But to me, you know, some of these articles and interviews I did back in the 70s, so they're old to me. Realistically, this for, 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 you know, succeeding generations of shadow fans, this is this is an eye opener. And do you think that? Uh, what, let me put it another way. Do you think that the popularity of the shadow has been rising or waning recently? With maybe in the, in the in the last ten years. I would say rising compared to the previous twenty or thirty years, because of the Sanctum Books reprints the ready availability of the Shadow movie on on various streaming services, as well as the older Shadow films from the the 30s and 40s. Um, So there's no question it's been rising how much it's... And also the comic books. There have been many comic book adaptations in the last decade or two. So these things are all raising his profile, but he's certainly not as popular as he was in the 30s and 40s. Can you tell me a little bit about how you, how your passion for Pulp Fiction started? Because I was researching you, and uh, I read that uh, basically your you, you, your in into that genre was your love of Doc Savage. That's correct, as far as buying and reading novels and 
collecting pulps. But if you go back to the early 1960s, 63, 64, when the shadow was rerun on radio, that was the beginning of the great old time radio revival. And I heard those broadcasts and there was a shadow comic book done at that time and some Belmont paperback books that were modernized versions of the shadow where he was recast as a kind of a James Bond character. That's where I first encountered the shadow, and that's where I first got a taste of Pulp Fiction, but I didn't have a comprehension of what that was until the late 60s, 69, 68, when I discovered Edgar Rice Burroughs and Doc Savage novels. So um, I point to the discovery of Edgar Rice Burroughs and Doc Savage as my true introduction to Pulp Fiction. And what was next for you? What was the next stage for you in uh, in being so uh, actually a lifelong devoted fan of uh, of the genre? Well, I I think what was happening in sixty nine seventy and seventy one is I was switching over from reading Marvel comics to buying paperback books, and for some weird reason I kept gravitating to writers that I didn't know were pulp writers or older writers. And so I was discovering um, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, Clark Ashton Smith, Robert E. Howard, as well as characters like the Spider and the Avenger and and G8 and others. So th there was a period where those things were being reprinted in paperback and I was grabbing them, not comprehending just yet what I was grabbing. Uh, I would say the major influences, you know, I mean, it's hard to say that definitively because what I was writing as a fan writer in the 70s, and what I'm writing now, there's an evolution from that. But my earliest writing influences were Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard and Lester Dent, who wrote Doc Savage, and to some degree, the significant degree, the Walter Gibson and the Shadow stuff, because I, I wrote a lot of Pulp Fiction that I never tried to market back then but as a professional now of course i write have been writing doc savage the spider tarzan of the apes king kong and i'm about to release a collection of my hp lovecraft influenced stories the wild adventures of cthulhu so um mm. even today i guess you could say i'm still writing um fiction that is largely influenced by the guys I was reading 50 years ago, although I've written other stuff that's not influenced by them. I wrote the Destroyer paperback series for 10 years. That's 40 novels. Not much of that influence in those books. They were very contemporary. Um, what do you think is the reason for The Shadows continuing popularity? Because I've spoken to other you know, people who work in the field, and most of them say that um, it's his similarity to 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 Batman, basically. Although he preceded Batman, I know by decades, and Batman basically stole the creators of Batman. Basically, stole maybe is not is not a kind word, but they copied a lot of the of the foundation of 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 the, of the shadow character and. Uh, Lamont Cranston and all and the Cobalt Club and all that stuff. But other than that explanation, what what do you think is the reason that The Shadows has been popular for almost 100 years now? Some of it is simply the recognition of the name and the idea of The Shadow because of the radio program or different uh, media or comic book things. Everybody seems to know who The Shadow is uh, or was. Um, and, 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 but but beyond that, I, I think there's always a market for heroes who are strong, mysterious, and powerful in the way they solve their problems. The, you know, the shadow's a little like Sherlock Holmes. He uses his brain a lot. But he's also a lot like anybody from Dirty Harry to, to you know, any character, the, the executioner in paperbacks, uh, Mac Boland. He, he brings out his guns when he, when he can't use his brain, he brings out his guns. And so it's very satisfying to see a character who has the ability to solve problems from several different uh, skill sets, including his ability to escape, do illusion, do uh, do do mysterious things, you know, trick villains and not just annihilate them. 
Um, so I, I think the sh given that the character has been in the public, American public mind uh, since approximately 1930, um, I would say there's an accumulation of awareness of who he is, even if you don't, haven't encountered him before, just as there is with Superman or Tarzan or Sherlock Holmes. You don't have to have read any of those stories to know who that character is and have an idea who he is. So when you know what a character is about, or you think you do, you know, and it attracts you, people will sample stories or listen to radio programs or, or watch the movie. It's like, I think I know who that character is. This, this has an appeal. But a lot of it is the mystery of the character, which was sustained mm -hmm. for a long time. He's a mysterious character. I think the best shadow stories are the ones before he revealed who he really was. Because a lot of times people were reading the novels to see if there were more clues to his real identity. When he was revealed as Kent Allard, the World War I spy, aviator, and explorer in the 1920s and his post-war mm -hmm. period, uh, I think when they revealed who he was, that was a turning point. And even then, it was still compellingly interesting at that point because the shadow was then juggling his Kent Allard identity and his Lamont Cranston identity. But then they phased Allard out as a, 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 a central figure, and he went back to being largely Lamont Cranston because the radio program had gotten so popular, and that's what radio audiences expected. And I, I think there is when the demystification began, when the radio program settled into its Margot Lane and Lamont Cranston uh, shtick. And, uh, um, there was no more mystery to the shadow, just as there really wasn't a mystery to him on radio after Orson Welles left the show and the character came became kind of simplified. As an expert in, in the shadow and the shadow mythology, there is a question uh, that I asked several people who are not experts like you, but were just fans. And the, 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 I never really, get, you know, get the, the 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 definitive answer to that question. So I, I'll ask you. I'm putting you on the spot here, but I've been dying to ask someone about about this. So I'm so I'll ask you. Uh, there is a book uh, written by Walter B. Gibson, one of the of the original Shadow stories, serialized in uh, no, I mean written in the magazines, called The Black Master. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I read that long ago. At the ending of that book, uh, the the black master, the villain, removes the the the, the shadow's uh, hat and mask, and says a very weird uh, thing, and sa says that uh, more or less I'm paraphrasing here that the man of a hundred disguises has no face. I know what you're referring to, and I, I talked to Walter Gibson about it, and. He was a little reticent to get into that because in his mind, they moved past that concept because he said it was too gruesome. What it seems to have been, um, because in an earlier story, there was talk that the shadow was really a man who in World War I had had a serious facial wound. OK, now, what, if you go on YouTube, you can see images such as I'm about to describe. But during World War One, there Soldiers came back wounded with a lot of horrific injuries, you know, lost limbs, but there were also facial things that were, were, were pretty horrible. Noses shot away, jaws shot away, damaged. Uh, and, and, and there was an industry in the 1920s for war wounded who needed facial reconstruction. And in those days, they didn't have the, the plastic surgery techniques we have now, so they, they would Doctors or, or cosmeticians would create appliances and give people artificial noses or, 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 or you know, artificial jaws or, or, the, make, or the, the appearance of artificial jaws so that people who were facially disfigured could be presentable to society. In other words, it wouldn't, they, they, they wouldn't necessarily get terrible looks from people when they went out and about. So I, I think the concept was originally the shadow had been wounded in the war in his face and there was some disfigurement that was fairly severe and that was one reason why the shadow always went about in disguise because his face was always artificially built up 
like Lon Chaney mm-hmm. in the in, in the silent films, who was the master of disguise in the 1920s. So, but Wal- Walter and his editors decided at one point that that the revelation of that was a little too gruesome, and they they basically pretended that never happened. Those scenes. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense because that book, the tone of that book from the get go, with the, with the explosions and, and the terrorism, it's uh, it's a very it's a darker book than than than, than most I think. Right. Yeah. And then and that sentence, that ending, uh, that revelation or unmasking, was very uh, is very disturbing. I think there were a couple of other novels where it was hinted that he had some kind of disfigurement when he was unmasked. I don't remember which ones they were. The Shadow Shadow might have been one. Uh, but Walter hinted at it several times, and I think they cut some out. I think there was a scene in the Python where when I read it, it felt as if the shadow had been unmasked and they cut something. They cut a reveal. So um, yeah. I think they carried that idea along for about three or four years before they abandoned it. So what are you working on now? I'm working okay. on a spider novel called um, Scourge of the Scorpion. It's my third spider novel. The spider was a shadow rival in the 1930s, a little more adult in tone and more um, emotional in tone. Uh, I'm writing, I'm, co- I'm, I'm collecting my, um, 10 of my, Cthulhu mythos stories into a, a book called The Wild Adventures of Cthulhu that will probably come out around the end of this year or the beginning of next. And I'm writing multiple Sherlock Holmes stories for various anthologies, as well as doing a column for Retrofan, which is a nostalgia magazine. My column is the Will Murray's 20th Century Panopticon. And uh, I write about old TV shows of the 60s and 70s, comics creators and, and other people you know, other things of interest, interviews and such. Uh, and there's other things I'm working on now that I can't remember right now, but I'm always uh-huh. always working on multiple things. Um, uh, regarding the Rise of the Shadow, your, your latest book, um, what would you tell fans, you know, the, why should they read uh, The Rise of the Shadow? Well, if you're interested in the shadow on radio, the first, I don't know, 50, 60 pages of the book are a, a history of the shadow on radio, how he evolved into the character he became, who were the principal players, some of the thinking behind the show. Uh, and so it's called The Five O'Clock Shadow, is that the name of that article. So if you like the shadow on radio, there's a big section. And then beyond that, it's interviews with Walter Gibson, his editor, John Nanovic, Theodore Tinsley who, was a, Tinsley, who was another shadow writer, Ed Cartier, the interior artist for a long time, and, and um, articles on Walter Gibson's uh, life in the world of magic. Uh, there's an interview with Grace Gladney, who was a cover artist for a while. So if you're interested in, knowing, in, in reading the uh, behind-the-scenes stories by the people who were involved in, the, in the, the, the magazine, I was very fortunate to have interviewed uh, basically anybody who was still alive that I could get hold of. And and when I assembled this book, you know, my thought was, well, you know, all these interviews are scattered in many magazines and fanzines and books over the last 50 years. Putting them together in one place might be, uh, might be something that people would like to have on their shelf. And we have a great cover by Joe DeVito, a great back cover by, uh, Court and Worley, as well as illustrate interior illustrations by Frank Hamilton and Colton Worley. So we made it for the first time in a long time. I've done an illustrated book. So we, we made this an illustrated book. So it wasn't just something you could read, but something you, you could enjoy as a as a from the bookmaking standpoint of having interior art and great covers. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. So I have just two final questions. Sure. Um, uh, for someone who's new to the shadow, uh, wh- which books or, or comic books or radio shows would you recommend as, you know, as a as a starting point? Well, on radio, I would start with the Orson Welles shadow episodes from 37 to 39, because I think they're the best written 
and the least formulaic. The shadow is much more mysterious. He has more powers, telepathic abilities and that he doesn't have later. And I find them very spooky and involving. In terms of the novels, uh, I think starting with the first novel, Living Shadow, that gives you a great entry into the character. But truth be told, the better stories probably start in 1933 and four, and they run until approximately 1940 in terms of the absolute best stories, with some exceptions later on, they're very good stories. But I think if you're going to read The Shadow in pulp form, read the 1930s stories. I could, I could recommend a lot of, you know, great stories. But, you know, the thing about The Shadow is Walter was always adding and subtracting um, to the character. And so you, there's, a, there's a continuity from book to book. It's not a story continuity. It's sort of a continuity of reveal in which the shadow, we learn a little bit more about the shadow or his agents. So those stories, strangely enough, were designed to be read serially, even though they weren't serial stories. But you can read anyone at any point and find it enjoyable. So, you know, I, I say to people, well, does a title or a cover appeal to you? Read that one. Well, I agree with you because uh, my first introduction to The Shadow, <clears throat> I think, was the movie. I saw it in theaters when it came out in 94. And uh, as someone who had never read The Shadow and who had never listened to the show, to the radio show, uh, I, ju- I, liked, I liked the character and uh, I liked the atmosphere, but I didn't really get... The, the, um, I didn't get the idea, I didn't get the references, although the movie, I think, is somewhat popular. It is popular in a limited way. It's not. It wasn't the success they wanted it to be. I spent two weeks on the set of that movie covering it for Starlog magazine, and I, I think they made a mistake because I saw them filming scenes three ways, serious, semi-serious, and comedic, and I think when they cut the film, and they edited it, they, they were inconsistent in the overall tone of the movie because it shifts from darkly mysterious to semi-humorous to comedic, you know, and then back again. And yeah. I think a movie like that needs, uh, needs a tone, a single tone. You can have some hu- humor in a serious film, but it needs to be, it needs to be the through line needs to be serious. Yeah. I agree. I still like it. I watch it every once in a while for the because it's the only like polished piece of of you know of of, uh, of filmmaking out there about the shadow. It's uh, true. Sadly, so, that's true. Yeah. So which takes me to the final question. Uh, why do you think we we haven't seen another shadow movie, or or to put it another way? Um, as an expert in, in in the shadow and as someone who knows uh, the value of the of the of the property, why do you think uh, the, the the character and the stories and the property itself hasn't been properly exploited uh, so far? Well, I, I, it grieves me to say this, but I, I I think a major issue is that if you look at the history of 1930s superhero style movies whether it's doc savage the shadow the phantom dick tracy uh etc etc they all underperformed at the box office they were all disappointments they didn't lead to sequels and um i think the uh, as we move more deep into the 21st century the 1930s and 40s become more of a remote time for younger audiences you know it's Mm. hard to relate i I say this a lot to people it's hard for someone who's in their 20s today to relate to the idea of the hero driving around and needing to pull over into a a a a drug store or to a phone booth to make an important telephone call you know we carry our phones around with us you know so that that kind of it's almost like you know it's probably one of the reasons the Western is not as popular as it once was. It's hard to relate to having to get on a horse to get somewhere. It's hard to relate to the absence of 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 
telephones or, or, or modern equipment uh, because we do things so much more speedily now because we have this equipment. So I, I think it's the fact that 1930s, 30s films generally don't do box office uh, the way, you know, filmmakers want. Um, and, you know, updating the character is a tricky thing, you know, and it may, it, then if you do see another shadow film, it may be in a modernized version. Yeah. Like the new uh, James Patterson novel. Yeah, which is, I, I think, part of the thinking behind that book is to create a shadow that could be filmed and made um, relevant to modern audiences. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining me. It was uh, it was a pleasure. I've enjoyed it. You're an excellent interviewer. You asked very clear questions. I'll be happy to do this again sometime if you want to talk to me again. <laughs> As you sow evil, so shall you reap evil. Crime does not pay. A shadow knows. <laughs> I'd like to end this episode of the podcast with a reading of the poem Ozymandias by Shelley. And I'd like to thank you for joining me for this episode of the Dark Fantastic Podcast. Please join me again. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command, tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. You've been listening to The Dark Fantastic Podcast. Flashes in the dark, tiny stories, vast dimensions. The players. He drew back the red curtain, a waiting crowd, nervous laughter, a few coughs, and then their eyes widened and took in what was before them. Minds twisted. Logic broke down. As one by one, they saw the red and the black dance, hand in hand. Text copyright Ahmed Khalifa. 2021. Ahmed Khalifa is a filmmaker and novelist. He is the writer slash director of several short films and a feature which was released on Netflix, and the author of a number of novels and short stories, including the young adult, horror novel, Beware the Stranger, available on Amazon.